tonight I've asked uh, Brother Ed Pappendorf to come and uh, give to us a testimony or a message, whatever the Lord lays on his heart uh, for the next uh, few minutes. And then after that, uh, I will uh, preach a message. But uh, Brother Ed is a faithful man. Amen. And uh, I love hearing uh, from our men. And uh, I, I know that uh, God has definitely used him here at this church and is using him and will you continue to use him. And he's just a great encouragement to me and I know uh, to you as well. So, Brother Ed, would you come ahead? And give us what God's laid on your heart. We're on. All right. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> if my voice sounds a little hoarse, it is. I'm still fighting a viral infection. It's not contagious or anything, but uh, it's still still bothering me quite a bit. So if I break up a little bit, please bear bear with me. Um, Welcome, and I'd like to just take a moment here, too, to thank uh, Pastor Schwader for this past week as, uh, as uh, Pastor Watson has been away that he's filled in for him. We haven't missed a beat. Thank you very much. It's, it's a blessing to have you and your family here, too. But over the past year and a half, uh, some of you may be here, some, some of you may have been here, some of you may not. I've talked about what I've called focus on the family. Uh, I've had the opportunity to speak about the urgency for all of us uh, to witness the gospel to our lost friends and family. And I call that focus on the family. <clears throat> I venture to say that each one of us have unsaved people in our family. Maybe just not family members, but very close friends. You know, today we're troubled by crazy events all over the world. Many people are asking, what on earth is going on? What on earth is happening? There's not a day you turn the television set on that something tops the day before, that you just, how could this, how could it get any worse? But it really is. Are those signs of the times? We're talking about pandemics, Wars, intense weather conditions, social and political unrest. You know, we're, we're coming up against the presidential election this coming year. Uh, can you imagine what that's going to be like over the next six months until we get there? Uh, it's going to be crazy. It's absolutely going to be crazy. Our nation is divided. Um, all stoking fears in our hearts. And just, just as Jesus proclaimed in Matthew 24, 5 through 15, those were the signs of the times. We're beginning to really see that. Um, my, ask, my, my, my wife, rather, uh, before we uh, got here tonight, she said, Ed, what are you going to be talking about tonight? <clears throat> and I told her, I'm going to be talking about hell. And she looked at me and she said, well, that's a really hot topic. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, it is. She, she's right. <clears throat> she's right. Uh, but the two previous times in talking about focus on the family, I didn't have enough time to fully complete that. So I'm going to call this part three tonight. So I'd like to complete my final thoughts on that uh, with the emphasis on what an unsaved soul might face at death. So as a result, I'll call, I'll call this the lost soul's first day in eternity, hell. You know, hell is a topic that most churches today, they don't want to talk about. They refrain from that. You know, they're afraid that people are going to get up and leave. They're not going to come back. They're not going to give anymore. Today's churches talk about positive thinking, the power of positive thoughts, <clears throat> looking to God to find positivity. In many churches, believers ask God for things as if he were a vending machine. When you're answered, you have the faith. And when you're not answered, you don't have the faith. Sound doctrine really is lacking. And I don't think I'm telling anybody that doesn't know that, that's out there. So why talk about hell? Isn't hell a place where ultimately that we're saved from, right? 
It's also a place where our unsaved loved ones could end up in. There are many facts about hell. Hell is real, and it is one of the two places that souls go to after death. There's no temp temporary holding ground or detention area, as some religions of the world talk about. We only have two choices. It's one or the other. Many unsaved lost souls go there. That's a fact. The Bible talks about this place as well as Jesus did throughout the scriptures. It's a place of eternal torment. And we heard that before many times it's brought up here in the church, Lazarus reaching, uh, reaching across the, the broad spectrum, asking Brother Abraham for a drop of water. Uh, I remember Pastor Watson or Pastor Perticone made mention that, you know, that happened over 2,000 years ago. That guy still hasn't gotten a drop of water. You know, another 500,000 years could go by. He's not going to get a drop of water. It's a place forever. Hell is a reason for all of us to address witnessing to our loved ones, right? And friends, as I mentioned previously, many theologians and pastors feel we're very close to the rapture and the tribulation. When I hear that sometimes, I get a lump in my heart because I know I have family and I have loved ones that are unsaved. And as much as I would love the opportunity, if the rapture happened while I'm standing here right now to be in the presence of the Lord, what a glorious, triumphal thing that that would be. But I'm also leaving behind a lot of people that may not have that chance. Maybe I'm their only chance. They may not hear it from anybody else. And if that was the case and the tribulation happened, they're going to go through that, or excuse me, the rapture happened, they're going to go through that tribulation period of three and a half cruel years. We can't, we can't even mentally think about what that time is going to be like. They may not make it. So it's a blessing that we all have this time right now, every day until that happens, to try to get that point out to them about of giving them the good news of Jesus Christ. Every day is that option for us. You only need to look at the signs of the times. We're not that far away. As a saved soul, we know exactly where we're going. The Bible reads in 2 Corinthians 5.18, We're confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus indicates to the thief on the cross today uh, that today you would be with me in paradise. Paradise. We can look to John 3.16. And Pastor Schwader talked about this morning in the Bible study the promise, 1 John 2.25. If you were here, you heard that. All of these are assurances and promises of the saved soul. We can absolutely know where we're going. But on the other hand, what about the unsaved? A different place awaits for them, a place called hell. God states very clearly there are consequences for sin. There are consequences for sin. You know, I was thinking about that word consequences for a minute, and I'm thinking about what's happening in the world today. Where are the consequences? You know, what happened? There's no consequences for bad behavior. Uh, there's, there's people getting knocked down in New York, beat up, murdered. They're back out on the street. That's incredible, right? But there are consequences, God says for the unsaved soul. And you can bet your dollar on that one that he's not going to change that at all. <clears throat> Pastor Schwader spoke this past Wednesday night that one little sin is enough to send an unsaved soul to hell. This is why it's so important that we get this message out to our loved ones and get it out fast. The problem is most humans don't understand the meaning of sin. They really don't. They don't understand what sin is and where it's going to lead them. But they believe for the most part, and you've all heard this, oh, I've been a good person. God loves me. God knows my heart. 
Surely he won't send me to hell. There are consequences for sin, and that is hell. As we know, when sin attaches to the soul, it can no longer be in the same abode that God is in. We see that when Lucifer sin, uh, sinned in heaven, he was kicked out. He could no longer be there anymore. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they walked with God on a daily basis. They were kicked out. They couldn't be there anymore, right? We also know that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, but when that took place, they couldn't be with him. They can't be in that same abode. So when a lost soul has sin attached to it, and that sin is not eradicated through salvation, that, so that soul, when it passes, is going to go to hell. That's a terrible thought. That's a terrible thought. Boy, I got quiet in here. <clears throat> so with the outcome of that, what might a lost soul's first day in eternity be like? And think about this. In reality, it may be only a few short days, a few short weeks, years, that we will be on our deathbeds, and maybe much earlier than we, than we all think. What might it be like for a lost soul awakening in eternity in hell? Well, I'm going to take you through just a couple things here. This isn't in the Bible, but I think very clearly it's probably right, and it's heavy hitting. As a soul takes his last breath at death, he realizes he is still conscious. Remember, we are never going to die. We have a soul. We're going to live. In fact, when we die, it's probably just going to be the blink of an eye, and the eye is still going to be open, and we're going to be heading somewhere very quickly. That unsaved soul maybe will be met by an angel who will lead him to hell and, told, and, and tell that lost soul that he's going to be re, uh, has to remain there until the judgment. As he leaves his body and this earth, the lost soul takes one last gaze upon the things of earth, a sight he will never, ever behold again. No more light. No more love, no more friendships, no more laughing, no more warmth, only the deepest utter darkness and torment, and that's for eternity. All of a sudden, the fiery gates of hell spring up before his eyes. The lost soul hears the roaring of the endless fire. The gates of which he enters are built of iron, encircled by fire with a large sign over it that says forever. The lost soul enters the gate and takes his place amongst the damned. Is that th it's at this point he realizes, or she, a few things. They realize that Satan and his hosts were not chained in hell, but were loose on earth, binding sinners with a chain of habit, Drunkenness, unbelief, leading that lost soul all through those years to eternal night. Too late. They now realize that an awful thing it was to take sides against Jesus and righteousness by living in sin on this earth. Now realizing that in committing the smallest sin, he, calls the, he caused the angels to weep and the devils to rejoice. Too late. The lost soul knows now that every prayer, every sermon, gospel song that he ever heard was a lifeline thrown out to him from heaven to rescue him from the place he now resides in. Think about that. And this, these things are things that this lost soul through eternity is just going to constantly be thinking of, constantly, never forgetting that. Too late. The lost soul has now awakened to the fact 
that all his supposed secrets, which he committed, uh, uh, his, his secret sins that he committed on earth, were not done in secret, but in, few, in full view of God. Now, we all think we can get away from things, and, and nobody's going to know. Remember, God's inside of us. The Spirit of God is in there. He's taking notes. Taking notes. Death and judgment are past. He's already been, been sentenced. Mercy's door is forever, forever shut. Many there are crying out for mercy on their knees, but the angel of mercy has flown away. God doesn't hear the prayers of the damned. That time is over with. No water to quench, quench one's thirst. No, we, we talked before, no hope, no friends, no light, no colors, no love. Can you imagine that? Sometimes we think here on earth that we have a rough day. Can you imagine a day there? Can you imagine eternity there? This is like heaven. The lost soul cries out. God's mercy was extended to me. I refused. Oh, that I had a moment to repent. And I let it go by. If only I listened to my loved one when he attempted to give me the gospel too late. It's too late. Nothing left but outer darkness in Matthew 22, verse 13. And the mist of darkness is reserved forever in 2 Peter 2, 17. Picture, picture on earth here, if you couldn't turn a light bulb on, you didn't see the sun, you didn't see the moon at night, and you didn't see the stars. It'd be pretty black, wouldn't it? Well, it's going to be like that in hell. You couldn't even, you couldn't even take a knife and cut it. It's going to be so dark. It's darkness that we can't conceive. The weeping and gnashing of teeth, we read in the Bible, heard and never ending. This is what the lost, uh, the lost soul experienced when he or she entered hell. And this is going to continue for millions of earth years and more. Millions upon millions. We live forever. You know, I've often said that we could consider our life here on earth if you picked up, <clears throat> excuse me, one shard of sand on a beach. That would be considered our lifespan here. And if you took all the other sands and all the beaches all over the world, that's eternity. Wow. So, It continues for millions of years. And remember, there's no way out. It's forever. I know this is pretty hard hitting, but hell is the last stop for the lost, unsaved soul. It is a reality. It is a place. And there's only two places to go. This is why it's so important for all of us to focus on our family and friends and loved ones so they don't end up there forever. Don't miss the opportunity on that. Um, many of us, myself included, have been turned aside for presenting the gospel, the good news. But don't give up. Lay that seed now and then follow up again and follow up again and follow up again. Don't ever give up. Put your loved ones on the weekly prayer list for the church to pray. Um, if you, I, I know some of you already do. It, I mean, week after week, you always see uh, my wife puts our family on that list. And I thank you all very much for, for praying for them. Prayers matter. Prayer matters. But remember, remember, there is the good news that God doesn't want any of us to go there. 
That's, that's, that's the good news. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross and, and paid that cost so we don't have to be there. Pastor Schwader also brought up another real important thing today. Know your Bible. Know the verses that you can help a loved one with. Memorize them. You know, it makes it easier. Explain sin to them. They don't understand what sin is. You know, they, they just think they're a very good person. Hey, I was there once. I was there once myself. Weren't we all at some point along, along this long road we're traveling here, this earthly year? We were there. Help them. Every day forward is a God-given opportunity to reach lost souls. We need to start today. Suppose there's no tomorrow. We, lost, we would lose that opportunity. So in closing, keep in mind one thing. Time is running fast and running short. Jesus is coming back, and very soon. So may God richly bless you all in that. I end in prayer. Lord, I pray this evening for all of our loved ones who may be currently lost, unsaved, that sometime soon their hearts, their eyes, and minds will be open to the good news, and they'll become saved, securing themselves with you in paradise. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate that um, uh, message, and that was uh, very, very important. And I would um, just challenge every single person here, um, after you're here, a message, whether it's in the morning service, uh, at night, Wednesday night, um, do something that'll help you remember that, writing it down, uh, maybe just a simple paragraph about what the message is about, but go home tonight and meditate upon what you heard. Meditate upon the message that you just heard tonight and ask the Lord, Lord, give me boldness when I have the opportunity to witness to the lost ones around me. Give me that boldness. But pray for them, and then pray that God would, uh, if they if they reject the gospel, that God would send messengers their way, and pray that God uh, would allow them to see God at work in your life, and the testimony of your life would uh, spark some kind of interest in them saying, you know what, there's something different about you. There's something genuine. There's something real that you have that I don't have, and uh, that was a blessing. Thank you. Appreciate that. Let's stand together, and we'll turn to Philippians. Jesus Christ died to save sinners, amen? And if you're not saved here tonight and you heard that message, um, hell is a real place. Jesus died to save sinners from hell. And the Bible says, uh, turn from your way, turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe on him for salvation. What he did on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. So tonight... We'll read the text, and then uh, we'll uh, get into the message. Here in Philippians chapter 3, continuing from where we left off, the Bible says this, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them, which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now I'll tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. 4 verse 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Heavenly Father, I need your help tonight to preach this message. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, as we... Uh, dive into this passage that, Lord, uh, you'd uh, teach us and show us, Lord, and that your Holy Spirit would use it uh, to uh, 
produce fruit in our lives, that, Lord, we would live uh, in a way that pleases you, and, Lord, that we would be conformed to your image. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. And the therefore harkens back to the previous chapter, chapter 3, and where it says in verse 16, uh, nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Uh, remember, there are a group of people who are pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ. There's, there's that group of people that are pressing. They're not satisfied with just a blasé, mediocre Christianity. They've made the decision, I'm going to press. I, I want to march forward. And then there's a ground that has been won. We've already attained. We've, we've made it this far. Let's walk by the same rule and let us mind the same thing. Let's stand fast. Let's not give up the ground that's already been gained. Let's keep pressing forward. That's the idea there. Uh, standing fast. And if you notice, uh, kind of chapter 3, we've been following uh, the Apostle Paul's autobiography, his past, what he was before Christ, what he is now. He's pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then we're going to get into our the future glorification. He'll change our vile body. And that's exciting that we have that to look forward to. We have that blessed assurance. May I tell you tonight, to stand fast, we need to stand fast in fellowship. The Bible says in, in verse 17, not only to uh, walk by the same rule as those who are walking by it. Verse 17 says, brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them, which walk so as ye have us for an example. Uh, you know, it's going to help you to stand fast for the Lord if you fellowship with like-minded Believers, when I say like-minded, it's not like-minded the way that you want to be like-minded, but the way that the scriptures tell us to be like-minded, uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ, following the truth of his word. Uh, that is going to help us to stand fast. Uh, fellowshipping with Brother Ed, people who have souls on their mind and, and know the, the gravity of uh, the battle that we're in, fellowshipping with people like that is going to help me stand fast. If I'm fellowshipping, fellowshipping with people who are like, huh, uh, that hell stuff, that Bible stuff, okay, you know what? It's a little bit too, hey, you better be careful. That'll influence you. You're not going to be standing as fast as you should be. And what we have today, by and large, is... We have people who are playing church. And by playing church, they think that church should be entertainment and that we should ask the kids, and I'm talking about kids spiritually, the entertainment that they want, and we should make that our pattern for how we live. But here, this is going to be, this is supposed to be adults, mature. Christians in the Lord saying, no, we've got to press toward the mark. We've got to march forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we need to stand fast. Go back with me to Philippians chapter 2. Stand fast in fellowship. The Bible says this uh, here in chapter 2 of Philippians. Fulfill ye, verse 2, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let's, let each esteem other better than themselves. I tell you what, here at Trinity Baptist Church, I believe we have this. I believe we work together well in, in unity as we follow the dictates of the scriptures. I believe that. And as we march forward and we stand fast in fellowship, it's an appeal to continue in that. 
the uh, Apostle Paul lays forth this idea of follow me. Look what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, the Bible says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Follow my example, he's saying. And thank God for leaders and I'm not just talking about pastors. I, I'm talking about anybody who is setting an example that another Christian can follow. Now, obviously, we have leaders in the church, all right? Uh, when it comes to the Christian life, uh, there ought to be an example that you can look to, that you can follow, who is in fervent, passionate pursuit of the prize. Of the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is following someone who is saying, I want to be conformed to the image of his dear son, Romans chapter 8. I'm pressing toward the mark. I'm not going to be satisfied with a lazy, casual Christianity. You see, this is God's plan. Christ is the model of perfection. Sinless. Perfect in every way. He is God who is manifest in the flesh. Being that model of perfection, he's given to the church people who can model the path of following the Lord Jesus Christ, model the path of pursuing Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ, uh, he's God manifest in the flesh. Uh, it's not possible for you and I in our human flesh to be sinless like Jesus Christ. But Paul says, follow me. And who was Paul following? Paul was following the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's giving you an example of someone who is passionately pursuing Jesus Christ in a loving relationship with him. That's all Paul wanted. He wanted to know Christ and know him deeper and in a fuller way. He wanted to be a partaker of the sufferings of Jesus Christ. And he was completely dedicated to that. And so God gives leaders. Uh, leaders of the church should have that, that passion, that desire that they are pursuing this relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that sets the example for those who would follow. And it's important, this pattern. Standing fast uh, in fellowship, you're not alone. Uh, so many times Christians begin to wander and they, uh, they become isolated and they maybe become discouraged. And uh, for whatever reason, they separate themselves from the fellowship. Uh, and they don't have someone in their life that they can follow and see God at work in their lives. When, when you're faithful and, and you're present, well, whether it be a service, but the work of God, uh, whether it be preaching the gospel downtown, holding a sign, passing out tracts, our soul winning evenings, uh, any function that we have that's uh, primarily designed to get the gospel out, your presence, your fellowship there allows us and encourages us to stand fast in the Lord. It really does. It's important. Second of all, we need to stand fast together because of many enemies. Many enemies. Look what the Bible tells us here in verse 18. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping. If I'm not mistaken, this is the only place in the New Testament where we have Paul saying, I am presently weeping for this. Uh, there's other places where he was sorrowful and he, he would weep. But he is saying, I am weeping right now because of this. I tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice, they're not the enemies. It doesn't say the enemies of Jesus Christ. They're enemies of the cross of Christ. So what that indicates to you and I 
is that there are, will be people who will pose as friends of Jesus Christ. But in reality, they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Uh, and this is found all throughout the scriptures. Demas was an example of this. Would say, oh, yeah, I, I love your Jesus. Uh, I, I want a fellowship with you. I, I want to be a part of your church. People who, for whatever reason, uh, they, they associate themselves with some form of Christianity, but they've never been converted. They've never been saved. And we're going to dive into this in a moment. They're enemies of the cross, and what indicates to that, uh, that, that thinking, that belief, that they don't know the Lord, the Bible says in verse 19, whose end is destruction. This is their end, destruction. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. I believe we see a description of these. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, listen, you say, you're just trying to raise the alarm bells. No, not at all. How do we know that? The Bible says many, not some, and not a few, many, many. I apologize, Second Peter chapter 2. There are many. The Bible says here, but there are also false prophets, also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. The Bible says many. And they have a problem with the cross. Of Christ. Go with me to Galatians chapter 2, and we'll see this, uh, this uh, in action, Galatians chapter 2. The cross of Jesus Christ shows us the atoning work that Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. And obviously, we cannot nail ourselves to a cross and atone for our sins. Jesus Christ did that for us. Uh, the cross, for you and I, signifies to us a self-denial. A following of the Lord Jesus Christ, where we deny ourselves and we follow the Lord. The Bible says here in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, I live in the flesh. I, I'm sorry, uh, liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So for a Christian, the Bible says, I am cruci crucified with Christ. I identify with him, the cross of Christ. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, uh, verse number 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. And we, we've looked at that previously. Only lest they should suffer persecution for what? The cross of Christ. The cross of Christ. They won't suffer for the Lord. Their God is their belly. There's, there's a uh, separation, if you will, to the cross of Christ. Christ said in Matthew 10, 38, And he uh, that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy 
of me. Many people claim to be friends of Jesus Christ, and they're not. They really aren't. Their God is their belly. Uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 18, if you want to look at that one. Romans 16, verse 18. The Bible says here in uh, verse 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. What do they serve? but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. So you have a group of people who they don't, they say they serve the Lord, but they don't, they actually serve their own belly. Uh, isn't it amazing uh, and sad that in these last days, there's a fascination with bellies. People worship their belly. They really do. I mean, people, uh, I don't get me going on this. I mean, just the thousands and thousands of dollars. I mean, come on. When you look in the mirror, what are you looking at? Yeah? Well, man, I got to lose some weight, you know. I got a little spare, you know. Come on now, right? There's, there's, there's that fascination with that. Now, I'm not saying if you do that, but I'm just saying people are consumed with what will make them happy, what will satisfy them. There's a religion that as you take a wafer and you eat that wafer and believing that that wafer is the body of Christ, God, they quote, my Lord and my God, and they swallow their God. Their God is their belly. <laughs> Something, isn't it? Sad. I want to show you an interesting uh Passage of Scripture, go with me to Judges chapter 12. Judges chapter 12. So if there's many uh, of these so-called friends of Christ who in reality are the enemies of Christ, we're going to see how they can be identified in this passage of Scripture. And by way of illustration, uh, we'll see a concept here. J Judges chapter 12, verse number 1, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon? And it's not call us to go with thee. We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon. And when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me? This is a civil war breaking out here. Jephthah versus the men of Ephraim. Verse 4. Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim, because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim, among the Ephraimites. So they're, they're lumped in all together. And among the Manassites, and the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when the Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, Let me go over that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? Remember, they're at war. If he said nay, then said they unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. Now that's odd, isn't it? We're at war, and we need to find out who is who. And we've got a test for you, ye men of Ephraim. Say the word Shibboleth. Well, what does the Bible say? And he said, Sibboleth, <laughs> for he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. So they, they gave him a test. 
Yeah, you say you're one of us? Say Shibboleth. And they couldn't say it. Sibboleth. These belly worshipers, they can't pronounce Shibboleth, if you will. They say Sibboleth. Uh, what do you mean? Go back to Philippians chapter 3. There's some characteristics. Uh, we are given to these in the Word of God. And it is very, very troubling when God's people have little to no discernment to understand that maybe someone they encounter that just because they, they claim the name of Christ or they use the name of Jesus Christ or they love Christian worship songs or they go to church does not mean that they're saved and that they know the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says in verse 19, whose end is destruction. So what's the, what's the shibboleth? Their end is destruction. Whose God is their belly. They're carnal. They don't really care about the things of God. They care about themselves. Their lust, their, their flesh, it's all about them, their, their recognition, their their fame. And that's what we see in the modern day church movement. Come to Christ and all of your physical wants and desires and needs will be met. As if Jesus is some kind of magic wand. That's not Bible. Whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame. You don't need me to tell you that that's where we're at. The things that people should be ashamed of that aren't even worthy and should not even be mentioned in a public setting such as this, it's so horrific and so terrible. It's shameful. That is exactly what they parade on Broadway and on Main Street. All the while they're saying, well, what's wrong with this? I... I am Reverend so-and-so of First East Presbyterian Church. They glory in their shame. And all the people that follow their example, follow their way, man, they have, they have no, no clue as to what the truth of God's word is whose glory is in their shame, and then the Bible says, who mind earthly things. Who mind earthly things. Our affection, our love, our desire ought to be on things above, not upon the things of this earth. And I, I want you to take a look at your life. Now, uh, you say, you know, preacher, uh, does this mean that if I have any kind of... Uh, problem or any kind of temptation, does that mean that I'm not saved? No, not at all. This is a group of people who, who walk uh, and claim to, to know the things of God and associate with the, the things of Christ. I'll give you an example. Uh, the circumcisers, they would say, oh yeah, we, we believe in Christ, but they added circumcision to salvation. They're not saved. They're the enemy of the cross because they're adding works to salvation. There's many, 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 many people in the world today who say and believe that because you're saved by grace through faith, then you're free to do whatever you want. After all, those sins have been paid for. That's not, that's not what the Bible preaches at all. The Bible tells us that sin is an offense against the Holy God, and when you come to Calvary, you see your sin for what it is, and you see the Savior for who He is, and you repent and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not this, oh, yeah, yeah come to Christ, and then you know what? Once you do that, it's just a free-for-all. Do whatever you want. 
not according to God's word. And so there's a shibboleth. God, their God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, and who mind earthly things. The difference, verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to save this for another message. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Uh, our conversation is in heaven. You and I, if you're saved here tonight, you are a citizen of heaven. You represent a country. You represent heaven. And that's, I think, something that we don't understand is a responsibility that you and I have. Is that because I'm a citizen of heaven, I have a responsibility to, to have my mind and my heart and my love and my affection set upon things above. Think about what is in heaven. Our Savior is in heaven. Do you love the Savior? What's in heaven? Many loved ones who have gone on before us. Do you long to be with them in glory? Sure we do. That's our country. Our home is not here on this earth. Our home is in heaven. Are you looking forward to that home? And so the appeal tonight is this. Stand fast. Stand fast. Mark, mark those who are a good example. Fellowship with those who are pressing toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. But then also be wary, be aware that there are many, many, many people who will maybe talk about Christianity. They'll have no problem talking about Jesus. They'll have no problem talking about worship songs and Christian music, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if they're not saved, they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you better watch out. And not only if they're not saved, but if they're going to influence you and they're going to bring you down so that you are not pressing toward the mark, you better be careful. You better watch out. The Bible says stand fast. Stand fast. Heavenly Father, Lord.